Morning, folks. Welcome to the 35th annual Kaiser Permanente Napa Valley Marathon. We have the pleasure of welcoming Dick Beersley back. He's been coming here since, I believe, 1997. And uh, Dick has uh, an incredible, incredible story to tell. Uh, I recall years ago when I was in college, we were told that uh, F. Scott Fitch, Fitzgerald had made the comment that there are there are no s second acts in uh, in uh, American lives, but then you realize that a uh, cat has nine lives, and Dick falls somewhere between one act and nine lives, and he's got great great stories to tell. He tells them in a marvelous way. So one of the best storytellers I know, Dick Beardsley. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. So, uh, gosh, I feel like I should almost be sitting down there with you and, and uh, more of an intimate type of a setting, but uh, I hope you're able to stick around after I'm done because, you know, some of the greatest women marathoners in history are going to be sitting up on this stage in about uh, a little less than an hour. So that's going to be quite a, quite a deal to be able to, to be part of that and to listen to, to some of them and talk about how far women's running has come. And I heard yesterday, I believe, that, is this true, Rich? There's more women in the marathon this year than men. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, I can remember when I started running in 1973 in high school uh, in cross country, that they didn't have girls cross country then. Then when I was a senior, they got to come out, but they were only allowed to run a mile because they thought, all parts of their organs might fall on the ground if they ran any more than that. So they've come a, a long way in a fairly short period of time. But thanks for coming in tonight. How many of you running the marathon tomorrow? All right, me too. I am so excited because uh, I first ran this marathon in 1987. I was coming off a double Achilles tendon surgery where uh, the orthopedic Olympic doctor rebuilt my Achilles tendon uh, about nine months before the 1984 Olympics. And he said, no running for six months. Well, I petitioned, see back then, now you can qualify for the Olympic marathon trials about two years before they actually are. Back then, you had to do it the year of the Olympic trials. So even though I'd run 208 in the marathon, I didn't qualify in that particular window. So I tried to get a buy into the trials, but I was denied. So six weeks after I got done um, with my surgery, I started training again. And I, it hurt, but back then I was able to take the pain and kind of put it in the back of my head. And uh, I got back up to running 100 plus mile weeks and I was running a race in Los Angeles and about seven miles into, a, I think it was a 25K race, my left Achilles snapped. And there went my 1984 Olympic dreams and there I didn't run another marathon then for, let's see, for almost, almost just about five years. But it got better and I came out here in 1987 looking for kind of a low key race at the time that I could hopefully run, qualify for the trials. And, and anyhow, so I came out here and, and was fortunate to be able to do that. But what's ironic is, so that was a five year lapse between marathons. Now I haven't, my last marathon I ran was five years ago here. And so, and since then I've had a couple of knee replacements not due to running, but some other issues that had happened over the years. So now I'm so excited to be back here at Napa. And I'm excited every year I come back, but I'm really excited this year because I'll be joining you out there on the race course tomorrow and um, we'll see what happens. It's, I haven't been this excited about running a marathon in a long, long time. So, uh, you know, now ask me tomorrow at this time and I'll tell you if I'm how excited I am or was or or maybe I'll still be on the course I hope not but we'll we'll see what happens but you know what a lot of people think because at one time I was fortunate to run you know 208s and 209s in the marathon that you know I was a uh, just a really good marathoner right from the very beginning but I'll tell you to be honest with you I was not like an L my old nemesis and now good friend Alberto Salazar who in his very first marathon ran two hours and nine minutes in 40 some seconds. I ran my first marathon in 1977. I was 21 years old. Does anybody know where the Pavo Nermi Marathon is? I know you guys know, because you're from the Midwest. Well, that's a good guess, because Pavo Nermi was from Finland. It's in the little town of Hurley, Wisconsin. 
way up in the northeastern part of Wisconsin, putting her into the UP of Michigan. That race has been around for almost 50 years now. Long, long time. Very small race. It's held in August, which is in the Midwest can be very hot. But I ran it in 1977 and I finished. But when I finished, I remember thinking I am never, ever running another marathon again. How many of you are, have run marathons before? Now be honest with me. How many of you have at least for a brief moment have said that to yourself? Yeah, we all have. That's just part of running marathons. In fact, a lot of times we say it during the race that we're running, actually. But um, so I ran that race in 1977. I finished, like I said, but man, never, never again. Well, back then I was going to the University of Minnesota, not the one you're thinking of. I went to the University of Minnesota slash Waseca, a very small two-year agricultural college, which is now a federal prison. So it kind of tells you about where I got my college degree from. But what I would do every morning before my classes would start is I'd jump out of my dorm bed, I'd go downstairs, I'd buy a Minneapolis paper, and I'd bring it back up to my room, pull out the sports page, and read the sports section before I'd have to go to class. So this Tuesday morning, I'd jump out of bed, I'd go downstairs, I'd grab the Minneapolis paper, I'd bring it back up, pull out the sports page, and i start paging through it. Well, I'm paging through it when all of a sudden, this little box ad in the right-hand corner of the paper catches my eye. It's an ad for the City of Lakes Marathon. It's what the Twin Cities Marathon is today. And for some reason, when I saw that ad, something in my brain said, I think I'm gonna run that marathon. Well, the problem was, I hadn't been training a whole lot, and the race, it was Tuesday that morning, and the race was coming up on Sunday. So I'm thinking, that's it. I'm not going to class the rest of the morning, and I pulled out two boxes I had underneath my dorm bed filled with various running magazines. I'm thinking, there's got to be an article in one of these magazines on how to train for a marathon in five days. Well, I'm, I'm paging through these magazines, and there's nothing close to a five-day program. I'm getting to the bottom of the boxes when I come across an article about these guys and gals that they didn't just run marathons, they ran ultras, 50 and 100 milers. And one of the guys said that when he ran them, he felt like he was floating like a butterfly. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to feel like I'm floating like a butterfly. Well, then I read the next sentence, and unfortunately, I stopped there. He said one of the ways he felt helped him to float like a butterfly was that he fasted. He didn't eat for a week. Well, I'm thinking, I don't have a week, but I got five days. So I didn't eat anything on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. So I get up Saturday or Sunday morning. I drive into the Twin Cities. It's one of those perfect mornings to run a race. Clear blue skies, 35 degrees, no wind. So I get out of my car, I put on my running shoes, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, Richard, now you know you've always run your best races when you've done a good solid warm up. Now before that first Pavo Marathon you ran a few months ago, you didn't really warm up at all. So I took off. By the time I got done, I'd warmed up almost eight miles. I mean, I got done, I'm thinking, okay, I'm good, and I'm rearing and ready to go. So I'm standing around the starting area there, and I'm thinking, all right, Dick, you need to find some people that are experienced at this thing called the marathon. Guys that know what they're doing, run with them. So I'm looking around and I look up towards the front and I see a couple of guys I recognize because I'd seen their picture and read about them in the paper a few days before. One of the guys was a sub 220 marathoner. The other guy was about a 225 marathoner, but between the two of them, They'd run like 30 of these things. And I'm thinking, well, those guys must know what they're doing. I'll just run with them. So I sneak up to the front, the gun goes off, and off we go. We go through the first mile in five minutes and five seconds. I'm within 10 seconds of my personal all-time best for the mile at that point, but I'm feeling like a million bucks. And I'm thinking, you don't have to train for these things. You just don't eat for five days. Now, my goal going into that race that morning should have been what? 
finish. Yeah, finish, have a smile on my face, and know that maybe the next one I run, I can run a little bit faster. Good goal, right? You betcha, not me. My goal that day was top 10. Because if you finished in the top 10, you got a trophy. Now, now this is 1977. Back then, I don't even think they made running trophies. You know what you got back then? You got a bowling trophy. You ever seen a bowling trophy? It looks just like a runner. All they did was snap off the bowling ball. <laughs> Honest to goodness. Even the bowling shoes look like the new minimus type shoes that are available today. Well, the trophies stood about that high, and I wanted one of them. So I'm with that lead group, hanging with everybody, and at about the third mile, everybody starts heading to the right-hand side of the road, and they start taking water cups off this table. And I'm thinking, those stupid fools. Don't they know that if you drink fluids and try to run any distance at all, you're going to get a side stitch? Now, that's what I was told. Well, obviously, it's just the exact opposite. But I went the entire way without one sip of water. OK, I'm only three miles into this thing, and how many mistakes have I already made? <laughs> but I'm hanging in there in that lead group. Well, at about seven miles, my feet start getting really hot. At eight miles, I look down, and the blue shoes I was wearing were getting a real pretty purple tinge to the front of them. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm blistering. My feet are bleeding. What's going on? I've never had a blister ever, and why now? And then I'm thinking, could it be? Honest to goodness, I'm not making this up. The day before, I walked into a running store in downtown Minneapolis. I tried on a pair of Nike waffle trainers. I put them on my feet. I jumped up and down, ran in place, took them off, put them in the box, set them on the counter, and I said, I'll take them. And the guy says to me, well, listen, buddy, don't you want to wear them around, break them in a little bit? I said, nope, I'm running a marathon tomorrow morning, and I don't want to get them dirty. So here I was. Now, this is back in 1977. When shoes back then, seriously, new ones were about as flexible as a two by four. Well, thankfully, in about the next mile or two, my fit, feet quit bleeding, they went numb, and now I'm back feeling pretty good again. So I'm still in that lead group, hanging in there, until about the 14 mile mark when I fall off that lead group. But I'm in fourth, well within the top 10 to get that trophy. 16 miles come by, 17, 18, just concentrating, really not thinking about things. I would remember reading through some of those magazines that I was looking for on how to train for a marathon in five days about this thing that happens at 20 miles called the wall. But the article I read said, if you don't think about it, it ain't going to happen. So I really wasn't thinking about it at all, and I'm just coming up onto the 20 mile mark, and I look down, and I swear to you, some guy must have jumped out of bed that morning with his PJs on and a can of blue spray paint, and at 20 miles, he wrote, 20 miles, you're at the wall. At that point, I'm thinking, that's it. My legs are going to break in two. They're going to fall off. But I felt pretty good. All I could think about, though, was the wall, the wall. But I get to 21, not bad. 22, feeling pretty good. I get to the 23rd mile. I go by the start finish line. All I've got to do is go one last loop around Lake Harriet, right back to the spot I just crossed. And I say to myself, Richard, with a big smile on my face, you've got it made. Folks, I'm telling you. I don't care if the finish is from here to the podium. You never ever say you have it made <laughs> until you actually cross that finish line. Because about two strides later, my perfect little world started coming to an abrupt end. I started cramping in my quads, in my hams, in my calves. My toes were cramping. I was cramping so bad my ears were even cramping up. I could barely put one foot in front of the other. Every time I did, I thought it might be my last. I was hurting so bad, I was literally running with my eyes shut. Every once in a while, when I'd open them to make sure I was on the right part of the road, I'd see all these old guys just flying by me, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there goes my trophy. Well, I came to find out that they still had like eight and a half miles left to go. But I finally 
cross the finish line and I collapse. I don't remember anything after that until I get to the point where I'm laying on a park bench and there's volunteers and race officials trying to get some fluids into me and something to eat into me. And every once in a while, I'd open my eyes and I'd see these TV cameras pointing down at me. And my buddies later said, Beards, you were laying on that park bench. We were looking at you. We didn't know if you were dead or alive. And then every once in a while, you'd open up your eyes, you'd throw out your arms, you'd holler, trophy, trophy, did I win a trophy? <laughs> and then I hear from the announcer stand as I'm spread eagle on the, on the park bench. And in seventh place, Dick Beardsley. And I'm telling you, I popped up off that table and I was smiling from ear to ear. And now I know how the Tin Man feels after a rainstorm from the Wizard of Oz. I walked up there just like this. Seriously, I could not bend my knees. So I get up there and I get my little bowling trophy and you'd swear I just won the gold medal at the Olympics. And I walk back over to the stairs just like this over here. Any of you running your first marathon tomorrow? You'll know what I'm talking about come Monday morning, okay? I got to those stairs, and seriously, I'm thinking, how am I going to get down them? I cannot move forward down the stairs. For the next week and a half, any stairs I came to, I had to walk backwards like this. And I really swore after that one, I would never, ever run another marathon again but thankfully the good lord has a way for us to forget about some of the bad things in our lives and i realized that if i wanted to continue to run marathons that i had to train for them and train very very hard and be very very committed just like all of you are but you know never in my wildest dreams even back then after i ran that race in 1970 the fall of 1977 Never in my wildest dreams did I think that five years later, less than five years, four and a half years later, I'd be standing in that little town of Hopkinton, Massachusetts, getting ready for the greatest foot race in the world, the Boston Marathon. That race that I ran, what they end up dubbing Duel in the Sun, it'll be 31 years ago in April. And I can remember it like it happened today. Now, back then, the Boston Marathon started at 12 noon. Not the best time to start a marathon, that's for sure. But I remember getting up that morning in the Sheraton Hotel in downtown Boston exactly at 7 a.m. I remember walking over to the window, pulling back the shades, hoping to see cloudy skies, a little bit of mist, and a tailwind. Well, when I pulled back those shades, all I saw was clear blue sky and this big yellow ball coming up out of the eastern horizon. I'm thinking, uh-oh, that's not good for a marathon that starts at noon. So I walk on over to the television set and turned on the Today Show. Do you remember Willard Scott? Yeah, Willard Scott, he was the old weatherman. Well, Willard Scott comes on there and he says, well, folks, it's going to be a great day in Boston for the marathon, sunshine and 80 degrees. Well, you look at Willard, you can tell he's never run a marathon before. So I started drinking water like you can't believe. All those electrolyte drinks that are available out there today, uh-uh. The one that was available, if you wanted to give it a try, was a drink called Erg. Anybody heard of it? Yeah, anybody try it? Yeah, if you're, if you're maybe 50 or over, you might know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I don't know what turpentine tastes like, but it's got to be close. But I drank as much erg as I could stand, drank a lot of water, finally get up to Boston. 20 minutes, excuse me, 40 minutes before the start, I forced two and a half more quarts, two and a half more quarts of water down my throat. At 11.30, I walked out of this little old lady's house that let me borrow one of her rooms to kind of get myself together in. I walked out of there and started to jog a little bit to warm up. And I'm thinking, what is that sound coming from my stomach? And it was this water just sloshing around in my belly. And I'm thinking, well, at least I'm well hydrated anyhow. Well, so I finally worked my way up to the front row. And I am standing just like this on the very front row. And the starter puts up his pistol and he hollers, one minute. And I look to my right 
and a couple of guys down from me on that front row is Alberto Salazar, the world record holder. He'd never been beaten before in the marathon. I look to my left, a couple of guys down from me on that front row to my left is Bill Rogers, four-time winner of the Boston Marathon. And I'm looking up and down this front row and I'm seeing Olympians and world-class athletes from around the globe. And I remember thinking to myself, Dick, what in the heck are you doing on the same starting line with these guys? But when it went in this year, by the time it came out that her side, I remember thinking to myself, Dick, you deserve to be here as much as anybody else. Just like every one of you do. Every one of you that are registered and will be on that starting line up there in Calistoga tomorrow, don't for one second think that you don't belong up on that starting line. If you've committed yourself and have done the work and put in those miles, you deserve to be on that starting line just as much as that person that's going to win the race outright tomorrow. And with that, the gun went off and Salazar shot out of there like he was shot from a cannon. I was right along his right side. We went through the first mile of that 26.2 mile race in four minutes and 33 seconds. And I am hanging on for dear life. <laughs> and let me tell you, hanging on when you still got 25.2 miles to go is not a good feeling to have. But I just kept telling myself, okay, Dick, you're a little nervous, you're a little uptight, just relax. You know you've done the training, you're gonna start feeling better. I hit mile two and I felt worse than I did at mile one. But again, I just kept telling myself, Dick, hang in there, you're gonna start feeling better. When I hit the third mile, I felt so bad. The first thought that actually crossed my mind was to drop out. How different my life would be today if I had made up some cockamamie excuse that everybody would have believed. Nothing was hurting, I just didn't feel good. I can almost 100% guarantee you I would not be here in Napa today. It's those moments in our lives that we all face when we don't think we can take that one more so-called step forward, but we do. And then once we take that one, we take another one after that, and then another. I thought, Dick, you can't drop out. You've worked too hard for this. I hit mile four. I didn't feel any better, but I didn't feel any worse. And at that point, that was a huge confidence builder for me. By mile five, I felt just a little bit better. And when I hit the sixth mile, I'm thinking, Dick, you've got a chance to win this Boston Marathon. It took my body six miles before it really got into that rhythm. That day, there was an estimated one and a half million spectators on the course. There were areas, especially the last 10 miles or so, where Alberto and I could barely run side by side. The crowd was so thick. As each mile went by, that lead group we were in got smaller and smaller until we got to the 17 mile point and there was two runners left in that lead. Alberto Salazar, the world record holder, and as the Boston Globe newspaper had dubbed me the day before, Dick Beardsley, the country bumpkin from Minnesota. Nobody had given me, or for that matter, anyone else much of a chance against Alberto. Well, some of you I know have run Boston, and you know when you make that right-hand turn onto Commonwealth Avenue at 17 miles for the next four miles, you're kind of continually getting up a bigger hill, a bigger hill, a bigger hill, until the last one is the infamous Heartbreak Hill. And my coach, Bill Squires, who maybe some of you saw here last year, said, Dickie, when you get to the hills, I want you to run up them as hard as you can and even harder on the way down. So every hill I came to, I ran as hard as I could, could try to shake Alberto. I'd get to the top and I'd run even harder, the little bit of a downhill on the next one before it would start back up again. I get to the top of Heartbreak Hill at 21 miles, Alberto was still glued to my left pocket. So I literally took off sprinting on the way down the other side. I got to the bottom of the hill. Salazar was still glued to my left hip. And at that point, I could no longer feel my legs. The thought of going five more miles at the pace we were running or faster was literally making me sick to my stomach. As bad as I was hurting, I knew Alberto, though, had to be hurting just as bad. And I knew this. I knew that no matter how bad I was hurting, I knew I could run one more mile. And you know, 
Back then, we didn't have the goos and the gels and the jelly beans and all those good things that are out there now, and I'll be using them tomorrow, let me tell you. We didn't have those back then, but the one thing we have with you, with us, I should say, 24-7, as long as we walk on this face of the earth, that works better than all of those things combined, and that's that good stuff the good Lord gave us between our ears called the brain, and that is some powerful stuff. And I was able to have my brain convince my body that body, all you got to do is run one more mile. I didn't have to run five more miles. All I had to do was run one more. Next thing I know, I see the 20 second mile mark. Still got that little bit of a lead. I say it again, just one more mile. Bam, there's a 23rd. Say it again, the 24 still got that little bit of a lead. And then as long as I live, I will never ever forget what I saw next. In front of me on that road, in blue and gold paint, it said 25.2 miles. And right below that, it said one mile to go. At that point, I got so weak-kneed and rubber-legged, I didn't know if I'd be able to take another step. At that point, for some reason, I flashed back. I should say I started getting tears just started streaming down my cheeks. At that point, for some reason, I flashed back to that day in May of 1975 when I walked off my high school stage, the first one in my family to get a high school diploma. And I walked out to where my mom and dad were sitting, and my dad, who had an eighth grade education, was crying. I handed my dad my diploma. He handed me an envelope, and he said to me, D, this is your graduation gift from your mom and I. So I opened it up. I pulled out this small piece of paper. In my dad's eighth grade handwriting, it said, D, this is good for round trip airfare to the Boston Marathon. Maybe someday you'll want to run it, love mom and dad. Here I was not only running it, but I was winning it. And I knew my mom were, and dad were back home in Minnesota watching it on television. I remember thinking, Dick, you got to get your mind off your mom and dad. Think about something, anything. Well, I finally thought back to a terrible blind date I once went on. I knew that was going to come in handy someday, and it did. And I got my mind off my mom and dad, back into the race, and with about 900 meters to go. Think about that. That's just a little over two laps around your local high school track. I had the biggest lead I'd had all day long, maybe an arm length and a half. I knew Alberto didn't have much of a finishing sprint, but I knew he had a lot better one than I did. And at that point, I pushed off with my right leg to give one last hard push. And when I did, I got the biggest Charlie horse in my right hamstring. It literally sent me up in the air. Alberto went flying by me like I was standing still. Five meters, 10, then 20. At one point, he had close to a 100 meter lead. But I learned more about myself in those last two minutes of that race that has enabled me, enabled me to get through way, way more difficult things in my life than that 1982 Boston Marathon. And what I learned in those last two minutes, almost 31 years ago, is that no matter how difficult the situation you're in is, no matter how high that so-called mountain is to climb, is that you never, ever, ever give up. As long as you're moving forward towards that so-called finish line, even if it's in little bitty baby steps, there's always that hope. It's about believing in yourself. It's about that commitment and that dedication. It's about having faith. It's about being in the right place at the right time. And as Alberto continued to get further down the road, I was running the best I could along the right-hand side, trying to work that cramp out. And when I was, the crowd moved back to let me come by. And when they did, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. My right foot came down into a big old pothole. I hit this pothole, I stumbled and pert near fell, but when I pert near fell, it jerked my right leg. And when it jerked my right leg, it popped the knot right out. Now I had my stride back, but now we're down to about six, 700 meters to go, and I'm thinking, okay, Dick, if you get second and give it your very best, you can hold your head high. But if you give up now, if you don't give every last ounce of energy, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. Honest to goodness, folks, never, ever before or ever, ever since was I given a gear 
like I was given at that moment. Honestly, it was like the good Lord looked down and said, you know what? I think I'm going to make this race really interesting. And I started pumping my arms and lifting my legs. And honestly, the next thing, it felt like I was on a magic carpet. I could not even feel my feet touching the ground. And Alberto took her right off of Commonwealth Avenue onto Hereford Street. And if you ever see the video of it, at that point, a guy named Bob LaBelle takes over the announcing. And Alberto comes around the corner. And he goes, Alberto Salazar has outdueled Dick Beardsley, presumably going to win this 1982 Boston Marathon. But about those times, the words of those get out of his mouth. All of a sudden, I come around the corner. But watch Beardsley, LaBelle is saying. Watch Beardsley. He's making a move. But the motorbikes, they got to get out of the way. I can't tell you how many times in 31 plus years, almost 31 years, I've heard from people that were either there that day, have seen it on YouTube, have heard about it, watched it on television back then, that have said to me, my gosh, Dick, the way you were charging on Salazar, if those motorbikes hadn't kind of broken your rhythm and got in your way a bit, surely you would have gone on to victory. Boy, you talk about the perfect excuse that I had, that everybody would have believed the people on that street corner of that live saw it happening that day. The folks at home watching on television. The next morning on the front page of the Boston Globe, there was a big picture of me and all those motorbikes. Everybody would have believed it as an excuse except the person that mattered most, and that was me. Did those motorbikes get in my way a bit? Oh, maybe a little but very little if they did break my concentration, but I got around them and with a little over a hundred meters to go, I caught back up to Alberto. And now after running over 26 miles, it now came down to basically a hundred meter sprint. And I got out kicked that day. was the first time two men had ever gone under two hours and nine minutes in the same marathon. Alberto won the race that day. Ran two hours, eight minutes, and 51 seconds. I was right behind him in two hours, eight minutes, 52.6 seconds. Yeah, I've done that a few times. <laughs> I remember coming through the finish line, looking up, seeing the clock still reading 208, and hearing I just got second. I'm thinking, wait a minute. I did not just run 208 and finish second. But you know what? At the end of the day, when I had a chance to look back, I really wasn't disappointed at all. Yes, I wanted to win, but that day, both Alberto and I gave it everything we had. We didn't give it 90% or 95% or 110% because that's darn impossible. But that day, there's no doubt, both of us gave it 100%. Neither one of us ran that fast again. But it's a race I'll never, ever forget. But you know what? There's very few people, and I was very fortunate to ever have a race like that at an iconic event like Boston. But I'll be honest with you. There's other runner, running things in my life that I've been running now for 40 years. 40 years I've been running. I love it as much today as I ever, ever had. Can I run 2.8 in the marathon? I can't even dream that fast anymore, honestly. But I enjoy it. When I go to bed at night, I am honestly can hardly wait to wake up in the morning so I can get up and go for my run. That's how much I love this sport of running. And some of my greatest memories of running aren't necessarily winning races or running a fast time. I know I don't have a, much time left, but I got one last story I want to tell you about a particular running story that has nothing to do with winning a race or running fast. So many, many, many years ago, I was invited to a little town in northwestern Wisconsin to run their Setna Mai race. Now, Setna Mai is Nor it's a little Norwegian town in Wisconsin. That's their Independence Day. They always had it the closest uh, Saturday to May 17th. Well, they'd called me up a few weeks before and said, Dick, we'd love to have you come to our race. What do you think? Come and give a little talk and then run the race. I said, well, listen, guys, I'd love to come, but gosh, I'm not getting back home from another event until late that night. And I said, it's about a six hour drive to get over there. Not a problem, Dick, we'd love to have you. And listen, we'll put you up in one of our volunteers that aren't gonna be home that weekend. 
He said, I'll check on it. And I'll call you back. So he called me back a little bit later. He says, listen, you can stay at their house. They're going to leave a light on in the kitchen. They'll leave the side door open, and you can take the first bedroom off the living room. I said, great, I'll be there. So I pull into this little town of Grantsburg, Wisconsin at about midnight. I am dead tired. Been driving for like six hours. I pull out my little directions that, that he'd given me, and I'm going down this road, not sure if I'm on the right road or not. When I see to my left this little house that kind of sounds like the one he's describing, and I see a light on in the kitchen. I'm thinking, well, maybe that's it. So I pull into the driveway, I grab my couple of bags, and I go up to the side door, and sure enough, it's unlocked. Thinking, great, I'm here. So I walk into the kitchen, and the kitchen light is on there, but no other lights. But I can see through the darkness, I can see the living room, and I see the bedroom door open off to my right. So I go on into the living room, I drop my bags, and I get butt naked. I am so tired, I just drop my clothes on the floor, and I go in there, and I'm kind of almost blind, but I'm reaching up for where the covers are. So I grab the front cover, and I pull them back, and I slide into the bed. And you know when you're real tired, and you first slide into bed, you know how good it feels to you get in there, and you give that big old stretch, and you kick your arms out to the side, and your legs? Well, I kick my arms and legs out to the side, and all of a sudden, I feel a human body on my left. And then moments later, I hear this old lady start screaming. So I start screaming, and I jump out of bed butt naked. I grab my clothes and my bags, and I run out of her house, and I get into my truck, and I'm driving down Main Street, Grantsburg, Wisconsin, at 1215 at night without a stitch of clothes on. And I'm thinking, man, I better get off on the side road because if I get pulled over, I got a lot of explaining to do. So I pulled off on a road at the end of town, got my clothes back on, and I slept in the truck. I'm thinking nobody's going to know the difference. So I get up the next morning. I put my running stuff on. I jog into town. I'm thinking, man, everybody's going to be excited to see me and whatnot. And I'm thinking as I get into the starting area, are they talking about Dick Beardsley coming to down and running their race? Heck no. The whole talk was, did you hear about some guy that slipped into bed with Gladys Peterson last night? Well, I, I finally fessed up, and I found out that Gladys Peterson was 86 years old. And I had a chance to meet her later that morning. I, I gave her a big hug, and every time I went back to Grantsburg, and I'd always stop in and, and see her, and then eventually, a few years later, she passed away. But let me tell you, she got the biggest kick out of telling anybody that would listen the night her and Dick Beardsley slept together in the same bed. That running memory is right up there with Boston. So think about that tomorrow when you're out there on the Napa Valley Marathon course. I know many of you are trying to qualify for Boston or maybe set a personal best. And for you first timers tomorrow, that's a nice thing because you're gonna set a personal best if you cross that finish line. But remember, and I've gotta remind myself of this, that running is more about just running fast times and placing high or qualifying for Boston. Running can be a lifelong, wonderful thing that you do. I know it's been that way for me, and I'm sure it'll be that way for you too. Have a great race tomorrow, everybody. We'll see you on the race course. Take care and God bless you. Thank you.